Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel Weinberg. I am a postdoc here in the um, Applied Computing for Scientific Discovery Group. Today, I want to tell you guys about how uh, I've been working to scale many body quantum materials calculations uh, all the way up to the exascale. Um, so, your first question should be what is a many body quantum uh, materials calculation and what is it good for? Um, so, broadly, I'm interested in using the principles of quantum mechanics to study the chemical properties of systems that are relevant to catalysis and like industrially relevant catalysis preferably. So we might want to understand the binding energy of a hydrogen atom or molecule onto a platinum surface like on the far left there or the transition state of oxygen reduction on a uh, iron nitrogen defect site in graphene like you know the middle picture both of which are like really interesting systems for electrochemical water splitting. But to understand how these systems work in a real device we would want to use large simulation boxes and uh, incorporate the effects of solvent molecules or an applied electric potential, which further complicates the calculation. Uh, additionally, we want to go beyond the kind of workhorse quantum chemistry techniques uh, like DFT uh, to get really highly accurate energies and forces. Uh, and so the technique we're going to be using is called the, based off of the random phase approximation, or RPA, as implemented in the Berkeley GW software package. And it gives really highly accurate energies without empirical inputs. We see in this graph on the right, RPA is in this little box here. What we're graphing is the uh, mean absolute energy, uh, sorry, error in energies across a couple different test suites compared to a bunch of other workhorse software uh, implementations. We see RPA does very, very well without resorting to any kinds of empirical inputs. Unfortunately, you don't get your lunch for free. Uh, calculating an RPA energy is pretty computationally uh, intensive. So we're just going to try and walk through what the uh, computational workflow looks like, uh, where I've tried to uh, represent the kind of computational kernels here with arrows and the data that they produce in the computer as these uh, rectangles. And they're kind of sized based on how they scale with the system size. So starting from our input, which is uh, basically a DFT calculation itself, we use the uh, MTXL kernel, or matrix element kernel, to generate what we call plane wave matrix elements between each pair of conduction, or unoccupied states, and valence, or occupied states. Both of those, you know, both conduction states and valence states scale with the system size. So we have n squared states, and this, making these matrix elements is basically a Fourier transform of the wave function, which also scales with system size. So we have an n cubed log n scaling for our MTXL kernel. But this has already been very well optimized by uh, Mauro, who I work with. Uh, and so we're not going to focus on that so much. But what it generates is this truly gigantic uh, matrix of plane wave matrix elements. So it's uh, n squared vectors of size n. And now the chi summation kernel has to deal with that. So what this it does is basically a matrix inner product, or it's a product of this plane wave matrix with its complex conjugate. Um, along the long n squared axis. And so this is going to then really reduce the size of the matrix back down to a n squared RPA polarizability matrix, which we can then invert and do some integration on to finally get out our RPA energy. So really, once we've done this massive summation, uh, it's really computationally downhill from there. But the size of this plane wave matrix really gives us a very large, but actually quite simply structured uh, calculation to do. Uh, and so this presents a really great opportunity for leveraging GPU acceleration. Uh, and to kind of see how this is going to work, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into what happens in this uh, chi summation kernel. In particular, in, we're going to introduce a little complication, which is that this plane wave matrix is far too large to fit on a single node. Um, and so we're going to have to distribute it and across a lot of different MPI ranks. And we do that by dividing up the conduction states. So each uh, rank will own uh, all of the valence states, but only paired off with some of the conduction states. And then we also need to redistribute the output, the RPA polarizability matrix, uh, across, say, a, a grid of four by four uh, MPI ranks. And so what this means is each rank is going to pull out a row and column submatrix corresponding to a piece of the RPA polarizability. Uh, is going to do some preparation on it, basically multiplying by a diagonal matrix. And then we'll do that um, particular row and column piece of the matrix multiplication and 
but then we do some communication at the end to make sure that each rank ends up with its right, correct segment of the RPA polarizability. The issue is that this large plane wave matrix and then the two buffers we need to hold the row and column submatrices are way too large to fit into GPU memory, even after we've divided them up over MPI ranks. And that means we need to transfer these row and column submatrices on their own each time we need to do one of these 16 multiplications. Um, and in fact, at some point, these row and column buffers are going to get too large for the GPU themselves. And then we'll just be out of luck. So just to give a kind of some concreteness to this, let's look at what we would consider a medium small example of a silicon 214 die vacancy center. So it's 214 silicon atoms in a box, and two of them are missing. Uh, and this is a potential system for quantum information science, things like that. Um, so in this calculation, we represent over two and a half million conduction valence pairs. And each one is represented by about 11,000 plane waves. So that's like 450 gigabytes of data. It's not going to fit on a GPU. It's not going to fit on a single node. Um, what this, how this calculation then plays out is each node will take, you know, on, on four nodes on Perlmutter, each with four GPUs, we will, you know, pull the row and column submatrices out and start doing matrix prep, which takes us about two seconds. We will then transfer them to the GPU, which takes another second. And then the actual matrix multiplication only takes half a second once we've gotten them on there. And this is for making a single block of the uh, RPA polarizability. So what we see here is that we're spending way more time moving data than multiplying. We're spending more time preparing data for multiplication than multiplying. This is not good. We need to tweak some things. So to overcome this basically memory bottleneck, there's a pretty simple solution. So we can split up the things that we need in memory into blocks that will actually fit into our GPU. Um, and the way we do this is now by dividing things up even further now over our valence states. So previously we distributed over MPI ranks on our conduction states, and now we divide up into blocks based on valence states, so we call these valence blocks. And the nice thing is we, can only, we only need to generate these plane wave matrix elements for a single block at a time. So if we have three blocks, we generate a third of the plane wave matrix elements, and then we can do all 16 multiplications for each of the row and column subblocks of this matrix, and then accumulate our RPA polarizability as we go through our valence blocks. The really great thing is we can size our valence blocks however we want, and particularly we can make them small enough that the whole valence block and the row and column subbuffers can fit into the GPU memory. This means we only need to do one data transfer for each of our blocks, and we can do all of this matrix prep that was taking so much time on the GPU. So to see how this plays out, we're going to zoom out to a slightly larger piece of the calculation, where we look at both the matrix element generation and now all of this chi summation. So along the top, we see the initial scenario, where we perform the matrix element calculation for all of our plane wave matrix elements. And then we have 16 repetitions of this motif we saw earlier, where we prepare, transfer, and multiply. And we do that 16 times. This ends up taking about 85 seconds. And if we look along this middle uh, row, uh, we see the basically a profiling of a real run on Perlmutter. And the blue represents GPU utilization. The green is data transfer. And the blank spaces basically are where stuff is happening on the CPU. We see that in this case, the GPU is mostly idle or engaged in data transfer, and we're not really efficiently using our com computational resources. Uh, we see in the new section, uh, we've divided up our MTXL kernel into three pieces. We only have to do one data transfer after each one. And all this matrix prep that was up there in orange now is basically too small to see. And we're really efficiently using all of our GPU resources. Additionally, this scales really well. We can scale all the way down to one GPU and all the way up to over 200. And uh, this in particular, this is even for these medium small examples. We anticipate to be able to scale much further than this. Uh, and really key, you know, just some key takeaways from this is that we have shown, you know, seen the kind of standard takeaway that avoiding data movement is essential to getting good GPU performance. We have this extra control over memory usage, and we can run on way fewer GPUs where previously our code would have crashed. We got really great performance gains and strong scaling. Additionally, we've implemented this using the OpenMP target. 
uh, so it should be scalable. We know that it's portable across HPC systems, and it's soon to be released in the upcoming Berkeley GW 4.0 release. Um, thank you guys very much, and yeah.